Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and you're listening to Gym on Bass. Welcome back to another episode of the Gym on Bass show. For today's very special guest, we have on a singer-songwriter and an incredible guitarist. He just came out with a new album entitled Dirt on My Diamonds Volume 2. Please welcome the great Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Kenny, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you on the show. And, you know, I'm based here in the Bay Area, and I'm curious, uh, where are you at right now? So I'm up in Santa Rosa. We're playing a show here tonight on the Experience Hendrix tour. So yeah, probably not far from me. Yeah, not far. So I'm going to see if I can sneak over there tonight to see you lay down some tracks. So big Jimi Hendrix fan. I, I'm rocking the shirt. So, you know, got to yeah. be in the mood. One thing I wanted to bring up right away was I know you sat in with Jimmy Fallon back in uh, 2010 and you played the actual white guitar that Jimmy played at Woodstock, right? So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Was that there tonight or? No, not tonight. Uh, they did bring it out the first night of the tour in Seattle. This so 14 years later, it was a reunion of sorts for me uh, where I got to play that guitar again. And uh, I think the second time it was even more rewarding. Like the first time it was just such a shock. It was like, oh my gosh, I can't even believe I'm holding this guitar, much less playing it. But it was also like... Uh, you know, it's kind of a challenge to play it because it was set up very different. Every guitar player likes their guitar set up different, you know. And that one is very different because, you know, Jimmy took a right-handed guitar and flipped it upside down and then restrung it left-handed. And so the way the action was set up and just the overall setup of the guitar was like way less than ideal of, of how I would have it. But I was not, not going to start adjusting anything. You know, with, <laughs> So you just kind of like had to play it the way it was. Hmm. But now after having that experience and, you know, it was a little less of a, of a shock, a less of an intimidating experience. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to play this guitar. Like I'm really going to play this guitar tonight, you know? So I think it, when we did it in New York, I was just playing it in and out of commercial breaks. And then we played it on, I played it on stage at the Beacon Theater later that night, but I think we played it on like one song because I was just nervous about, you know, maybe potentially struggling a little bit with it. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to do anything wrong or play a bad note or whatever. So I kept it kind of short and sweet. This time I played it on like three or four songs and man, I was really good. <laughs> so it was great. Awesome. Like, how does that come about? Who owns that guitar then? Well, so at the time, 14 years ago, Paul Allen, who was the co-founder of Microsoft, Paul owned it and he had it on display at his museum. At that time, it was called the EMP Experience Music Project Museum in Seattle. Now, I think they've changed the name of the museum to Mopop because mm -hmm. uh, it's more of a pop culture museum, but the guitar still is on display there. Paul passed away back in 2019, I think, or the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And so, you know, his estate still owns the guitar and still has it on display at that museum. So they took it out of the display and brought it down to the Paramount Theater in downtown Seattle, just up okay. the road from the museum and, so that I could play it. Awesome. We're talking about the tour that just started, too. You, I know you're on the road. So where is home for you, though? Where do you live when you're not touring? Well, I'm originally from Shreveport, Louisiana, but my home is now is in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good. We've only been there for about four years now, but really enjoying living in that state. People are very friendly, you know, nice place to, to raise a family for sure. Nice. And I know uh, you're a busy guy. You got the new album. You're on the road right now. Uh, you also have six kids, right? So you're probably busy doing the soccer practice drop off and all that or? Not soccer, but yeah, my kids are involved in a lot of things. And, you know, with six kids, you can imagine that when I'm home, my family life is very full. So, you know, it's like my goal has been since starting a family and getting married to my wife and starting a family. It's been like to try and find the right balance, you know, between I have a commitment to my fans and my career and I have a commitment to my family and my wife and my kids. And so how do you balance those two commitments so that not either one of them is feeling neglected. And so that's been my priority. So when I'm home, I'm not really playing guitar very much. You know, I might occasionally go out if a friend of mine is in town playing a show and maybe I'll go sit in with somebody here and there, but not really that much. And, and the lives of my kids are so full and so busy that it's like, there's not a lot of time for me to just sit around the house playing guitar. It's like, you know, we hit the ground running when I'm at home. <laughs> 
it's all about like being focused on the family and being present for them and, and participating in their lives and what's going on. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting and, and very fulfilling life between trying to like maintain my career and maintain my family life. It's good. Dad by day, rock star by night, right? It's not bad. Yeah. It's funny too. Cause like, you know, my kids, well, some of them are coming out on this tour, mm. which is younger ones are going to, we used to bring them out on the Hendrix tour when they were all little because uh because we could and it's a great tour for that because you know we have a lot of downtime during the, mm. the day and we would take the kids to like the zoo or like the children's science museum or whatever so they're the three little ones are looking very much looking forward in a couple of weeks to coming out here they're totally about being on the tour bus and stuff <laughs> uh but yeah it's funny like you know there's some point where where they they don't really realize what's going on they're so little they don't really grasp you know that there's thousands of people here to watch dad do what he does and then at some point they it hits them and then at some point they're like i don't know you're you're their parents so it's like ah you're really not that cool anyway yeah yeah, yeah people come see you but so what you know so mm. it's an interesting dynamic for sure <laughs> Well, it also makes me wonder, fans know that you're into cars. You have some on album covers and you've made postings about it. So uh, do you have a dream car yet? Or is that something that's always been in process? Is there something oh, out there? It's always evolving. It's like, you know, well, what I do is, is like, I have like, I have goals, you know, I like to set goals and then set out to accomplish them. And sometimes it takes years and years and, mm. and that's absolutely fine. I'm committed and I'm methodical. So, but once you know, like for me, it was like a 70 Plymouth Barracuda convertible was like be all end all. And then I got one and we started building it. That's the car that's on the cover of both of these new mm -hmm. albums, Dirt on My Diamonds, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Volume 1 shows the car in its current state where we've got it torn apart and it's like being slowly put back together and restored. And so it's a project car. And then mm -hmm. Volume 2 shows a rendering of what the finished product is going to look like when we finally get it done. Um, but once, as soon as I got that car and we started working on that, then it's like, oh, well, what's the next one? And it's like, oh, well, I got the Dodge Demon. And then it was like, okay, I'll get that. And then it's, well, what's next? Well, then it's like, I got, I really want a Viper. So, you know, but <laughs> years like to get the, to the point where it was the right time and the right car and the right moment, you know, to get the Viper. And then it was the, the new Dodge Demon. And so now it's like, you know, it's just not, but it's cool because, you know, it's like, it shows, it, it's just, I'm a goal oriented person, you know, and I go, okay, I, I want to do this. I want to see if I can accomplish this, whatever it might be, musically, in the car world, whatever. And, and it's not overnight. I don't expect things to happen overnight. And I'm okay with building and working and saving and whatever you got to do to get to that point. And then you sit back and you go, I worked this hard to make this a reality. And now it's a reality. You know, and it's great, but you don't stop there. You said, mm -hmm. say, well, what's the next goal? And then you work towards that. One. Yeah. 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 It makes sense. And it made me wonder though, when you have all these cool cars, everyone likes to drive fast, you know? So uh, do you have any good uh, speeding ticket stories then? Or are you able to weasel your way out? <laughs> I that I want to share with you. I can tell you that. <laughs> we yeah. keep all that private. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of, you know, talking about, building and making goals it kind of sounds similar to me like making an album so i know uh this all kind of came at once right it wasn't like you wrote the first album and then did volume two uh you kind of made a double album right well that yes and i actually wasn't intending on doing a double album i always write more songs than i need for a record mm -hmm. so we always have extra songs and uh, sometimes i'll be working on multiple albums at once but we'll only put one out and then you know the other one comes out a year and a half later. Mm. Um, but this time I just thought, you know, this would be, uh, it might be cool to do something different and like do a companion package where it's like volume one, volume two, a double album, if you will, but not released all at once and stagger the release. Um, so it keeps the fans engaged, you know, but for the very first time I'm putting two new albums two albums of new material out in less than 12 months, you know, apart from each other, which I've never done. And it just keeps the, the narrative going. It keeps the fans engaged. It continues to give us, you know, new music to play, keeps us out on the road doing what we love to do. But yes, most of these songs are written all during that 
writing session where we went down to Muscle Shoals and wrote all these songs, we spent a week in Fame Recording Studios down there. And we went down there because there's a vibe down there. And, you know, we didn't we weren't trying to manufacture songs that had the Muscle Shoals sound. But we just knew that just being there, it was going to have some sort of influence on the music we were creating and writing. I believe that it did. So, you know, looking at this, I, I saw two very distinct albums starting to take shape, but they were connected, you know, by where they were originally uh, conceived, all these songs. And, you know, that we can make a compelling package by doing a volume one, volume two companion pieces. Nice. Well, it made me wonder, you talk about going to the studios and as you know, nowadays, so many musicians like to record from their home or like do like a laptop type software thing. So do you ever like recording at home or is it more about getting into the studio and, and being well, I inspired? Can't record at home. I don't have a studio at home. Like I plan on trying to make a studio at home, but like I haven't gotten there yet. But for me, it's not like, it's not a, it's not like if I make a studio at home, it's going to be a studio. I can make all my records like the way I make records. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I'm going to put some, I'm going to have a little closet off to the side with some sound editing material and a laptop. And I'm mm -hmm. going to like play something and email it to someone somewhere else. If I make a studio, it's going to have a live room and I, I've already got designs, but I just haven't had the time to try and build it. But isolation booths, control room, the whole nine yards so that I can make records the way I make records. Mm -hmm. And that, and that means the whole band playing there together as live as possible on every track. And uh, I'm not a fan of like the modern way of making records because what it does is it takes the, the element of spontaneity out of the equation. You can't have a spontaneous moment. Mm. If you're emailing a song to somebody, whoever gets their hands on the song first determines the outcome for everyone. So like they'll make this uh, and some people do it like they'll write a song and they produce their demos. They overproduce their demos to the point that the demos become the record. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they may go, oh, well, this is great because it saved us money and it, we got it done faster and whatever. But it's like there's a disconnect there. And whoever got to put the click track and the first track down has just decided for every other person that's going to play on it what the arrangement is all the part you know it's like that you have this is what you have to play from here to here and that's that and there's no opportunity for people to be in the room and go hey what if we did this or instead of going there what if we you know played this part and all go to this you know and you can't do it that way and i can hear a disconnect in i can hear it might be subtle but when you have guys playing in a room together at the same time there's this there's this interaction, there's this energy exchange between those musicians that's absent when you just have people overdubbing parts, mm. you know, but never actually play the parts together. And I can hear it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm just an old fashioned kind of guy. And as a result, I think my records cost more uh, to make because, mm -hmm. you know, it takes longer sometimes to get the song finished because we're literally, I go in the studio and we have my demos are an acoustic guitar and a vocal, and that's it. And we build everything hmm. in the studio. Well, that makes me wonder then, uh, that type of scenario. Do you get more excited over a good guitar lick or a good lyric? Or does one lead to the other usually or no? Well, it's not one or the other. It's just like what I just want to get excited about something, you know. Mm. So if it's the guitar riff, then great. If it's the lyric, then great. If it's the vocal melody, great. But I just need to have something to get excited about in the song in order to move forward with it. I would say 90% or more of, of all of my song ideas start with guitar, mm -hmm. whether it's a lick or a groove or a chord uh, change or something like that. And then, you know, 10% start with, I have a great idea for a song title, or I have a great <clears throat> hook line for a chorus, or I have a cool melody in my head. What can, what words can we put to it? Mm -hmm. You know, but 90% starts with guitar for sure. Well, one of the songs that I really love on the new album is I Got a Woman, leading track. And uh, it made me wonder, how long have you been married and how did you meet your wife? Well, my wife and I met through mutual friends. I mean, you know, it's like, it's as simple as that. But like, we've been married now. We just had our 18th wedding anniversary. Wow. We've been together for 21 and a half years. 
Uh, so we dated. We were together almost four years before we got married. We tried not to rush into anything. I mean, I I honestly uh, recommend, you know, people don't rush into things like marriage and like <laughs> spend some time together and get to know this person. Find out. Please have the conversation of what does marriage look like to you and see if you're in, even close to being on the same page. Mm -hmm. Because I find that I have found that a lot of times, like people don't have that conversation before they get married. And then one person thinks that a marriage is supposed to look like this. The other person thinks it's supposed to look like that. And then when they find out that it doesn't fit either one of their ideas of what marriage is supposed to be, then it's like, oh my gosh, this is broken. Like, you know, and they can't fix it. And it's like, mm -hmm. but you guys didn't even know if you were working towards the same goal in the first place. It's like, let's get on the same page. You know, there's conversations. A lot of things could be uh, could could be avoided just by communication and conversation on the front end and building the foundation, you know, first. And so I, we did that. I'm not saying we have a perfect marriage, but I think, you know, we put in the work on the front end and really tried to communicate and build a solid foundation for a marriage. And so, you know, it's lasted a good while. Well, it makes me wonder when you have six kids, you have a big family, Who's kind of the tour manager of the family? Does she keep you guys in line or how does that work? Oh man, 100% my wife is the glue. And I think, you know, you'll find that just about any man will, t will tell you that, you know, about, about their wife, if they have a family and stuff. And especially in my position. Um, <clears throat> but we, what's great about it. And I think what, how a lot of relationships should be, you know, they say opposites attract and, kind of generalized statements like that. But I have found that my wife makes up for my shortcomings. She, her strength, she's strong in the areas that I fall short and vice versa. And so in that regard, we, we, we balance each other out within the family dynamic. And I think that is remarkable because, you know, where I lack understanding uh, or ability, if, if she didn't, have those abilities naturally then like there would be this void like for our children or for our marriage or whatever and so because we balance each other out like that i think that's one of the the components that that keeps things you know productive and working for the family well i am always curious you kind of said it a little bit earlier uh it sounds like when you're on the road a lot and you're on tour you kind of have breaks or time built in where they can visit you or be on the road with you then yeah. Well, what happens is, is we found out like we experimented early on. We first started having kids and it's like you just you it's trial and error. And it's like, OK, well, how many weeks is too many weeks for me to be gone? Right. Um, and so we kind of figured out trying a number of different things that, you know, five weeks is about the max for me um, to be gone before I got to come home and reconnect with the family in person and you know spend some time with them before i can go back out again mm -hmm. in order to keep everything the way it needs to go and and that keeps the career thriving and the home life thriving you know and mm -hmm. uh so that's been it it's and my wife when i'm not there man it's like she's handling it all herself six kids you know it's like it's remarkable plus she has a number of different things that she's doing for herself and and her own business and uh she's actually it's it's remarkable um, but when i come home from being on the road what i have historically always tried to do is to thrust myself immediately into the home life and try and take take some of the pressure off of her and give her a break. Like when the kids were little, like now they all sleep through the night. So it's different now, but when they were little and, and they're waking up like super early and stuff, I'd come home from being out on the road for five weeks. And I'm like, but the kids start waking up at like five in the mornings, five 30 in the morning, and the baby's crying in the night. And I jump up and I would try and, and be the first one to deal with it to give her some sort of a break because you know when i'm gone she has no choice like she has no break and so you know i think that's like part of like you know and she and she, and she does that for me too in her in her ways like she'll she makes my life so much easier in so many different ways and so i try to just to show that like hey man you know i i realized i was gone for like five weeks and i won't come back i want to and you know she she doesn't necessarily need my help because she's handling it all 
on her own when I'm not there. But I just want to show like, you know, hey, I'm trying to I'm trying to like, you know, yeah. trying to do this so that you can, you can like rest a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know uh, how old your kids are at the oldest ages, but it made me wonder, are they getting to the age at all? Or are they starting to rock like band T-shirts or get into your record collection, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, they're all kind of doing their own thing. I'm not pushing anybody in, in you know, nobody pushed me to play music. Mm -hmm. I did because I love to play music. I found the instrument and I found satisfaction and joy in playing and and learning it. Like, because it wasn't easy. It was like, it took work. It takes work mm -hmm. for everybody. Even if you're a prodigy, you have to put in the work and the practice. Um, so all my kids are musical. My daughter, my oldest daughter's playing guitar. One of my other, the next oldest daughter, she's playing guitar around the house and singing. Um my oldest son listens to music nonstop. He listens to different kind of music, but uh, I, you know, they're all so musical. I can see it in each one of them, like that music is a natural part of who they are. And if they chose to immerse themselves in an instrument or creating music, like uh, any one of them, I think could have a career in music. Nice. But I just don't feel that it's my place to have to try and push them in that direction because nobody did that for me. Yeah. Well, uh, we spoke a little bit before we started. The first time I've seen you in person was uh, in San Francisco at the Bill Graham Civic Center. And uh, you were part of like the all-star Jim Ursay band. So I was just curious, how did you know him? Does he just reach out to his favorite artists and create this band or how does it work? I've known Jim almost like going on, uh, I guess, 20 years now. Mm -hmm. So Jim and I... We met in the early 2000s, and Jim's a, a guitar lover, a music lover. I mean, the guy's like an encyclopedia of music. He's actually incredible. The depth of his knowledge about music and music history and artists. Anyway, so uh, I'm a football fan, and he's a music lover, and so we connected. And then uh, this whole thing goes all the way back to like when the Colts, it was 2006, 2007, February 2007, they played, they went to the Super Bowl, they played the Chicago Bears in Miami, and they won that mm -hmm. year. And I had been invited out along with, you know, other people and uh, to, to come to the Super Bowl. And the, the core of the Jim Ursay band began then. And it was mm -hmm. like Andy Arnoff on drums and Mike Wanchek from John Mellencamp's band on guitar and kind of like the musical director of our band, Mike Mills from REM on bass, mm -hmm. myself on guitar. And then there was a couple of other people there, like Mellencamp was there, and Mellencamp has also been a guest at a couple of the Ursa band gigs. Um, and then Stephen Stills was there and played, and he also has joined us. He was there in uh, yeah, San Francisco so for that show. Um, so, so many of the core players, the nucleus of the Ursa, Jim Ursa band were there that night. And it was a spontaneous jam. It was not rehearsed. It was like Jim was throwing a dinner party for his family and his friends and other team owners the night before the Super Bowl. And we just all got up there and just jammed. And we, we rocked the house for like two hours, completely unrehearsed, playing everybody's hits and all kinds of stuff. And it was a really incredible night and uh, amazing experience. But if you look at who's on stage now as the Jim Ursay band traveling with his collection, when we do those shows, it goes back to that night. That was kind hmm. of like the seed that was planted at the very beginning of it all. Nice. That's good for me to know because I got such a kick out of going to that show. And if people don't know, they're always free shows. And as you know, he shows off his museum, basically, of music history, U.S. history. I know there's, like, signed Abe Lincoln documents and stuff, so it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, he's cool, man. He's one of those guys, like, you hear about guys like him that have a lot of money and they're passionate about certain things, and whether it's art or music or whatever, and they acquire things. But you hear they acquire it, or maybe you don't even hear about it. But, like, if you do, it's, like, it's acquired, and then you never see it again. You know, it's like, it's just for them. But he's yeah. he's of the opinion that, like, he knows how much he's been given in his life. And he knows that he's in a unique position to to 
affect other people in a positive way. I mean, he's one of the most generous, kind-hearted guys like I've ever met. He's the kind of guy like you you would like to think that if you had all that money mm-hmm. that you would do those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of guy he is, man. And so he wants to bless people and he wants to share this stuff because he's so excited about all these items that he also wants other people to be able to enjoy them. And so he created this traveling museum and it's, it's unbelievable stuff. I mean, he's got Ringo Starr's drum kit yeah. from the Ed Sullivan show when the Beatles first came over to the U S he's got David Gilmore's famous black Stratocaster from Pink Floyd. He's got Jerry Garcia's tiger guitar from the grateful dead. He's got, you know, one of the only privately owned copies of the declaration of independence. He's got, you know, JFK, they made a Stetson hat, a custom hat for JFK that was supposed to be given to him the day he was assassinated, wow. but they didn't give it to him because he got killed. Um, he's got Abraham Lincoln's walking cane. Uh, I mean, just like he's got, I mean, it's just un- unbelievable. And he's got the original manuscript to the uh, big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is oh, the I remember that. millions and millions and millions of people's lives yeah. as a result of AA. And so, and he wants people to be able to to see the stuff and enjoy it and for it to continue having an impact on, on people's lives. So traveling museum with a live all-star concert with rock and roll hall of fame, you know, quality guests and, yeah. and it's all free. And it's his way of just like giving back to people because he knows he's been given so much, you know, and he's that kind of guy. Well, uh, one thing I asked Kenny Aronoff too, uh, I said, did you, have you ever gotten to play on that Beatles drum kit? And he said he has. So I was wondering, uh, do you handle any of the guitars or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they will at that show uh, in San Francisco, but it became part of every show now. But like that show, they brought out Jerry Garcia's guitar and we played mm. a great song. And then they brought out the David Gilmore Strat mm. and we did uh, Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. Oh, I was going to uh, mention that was one of the highlights of the show for me. Yeah, well, I was playing David Gilmore's actual wow. guitar in that song. And that's become a part of every show that we do. Um, and I think on that show, we also did a Bob Dylan song and they brought out the Stratocaster that Bob Dylan first played oh, like, okay. for folk festival. Wow. So, yeah. And that's one of the cool things is like these museum pieces are also still being put to use and we're entertaining people with these instruments and stuff and still creating art and, and music with them. Nice. Well, that's awesome stuff because uh, one thing I was going to lead to next was no matter who I have on, whether it's an athlete, comedian, musician, I know you kind of had an interesting upbringing with what your dad did for a living, right? So I was just curious, who was your first concert? That's what I asked everybody. Or what's one that made a big impact on you? Well, my first concert, according to my dad, was to see Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker when I was three years old. Wow. So <laughs> I believe that, you know, anybody that could see Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker would would become a fan and so for me to hear that and see that at three years old i think that's one of the primary reasons that i was drawn to blues music my whole life you know from was from that being my very first concert wow that's but if that's how you're going to start that's a pretty good way to go (laughs) and since we're talking about like important guitars through uh, music history that Jim Ursay has made me wonder do you have your first guitar or do you have one way back from when you started still yeah, I still have my very first guitar. Wow. I also have my very first Stratocaster that I got the Stevie Ray Vaughan autograph for me when wow. I was like 15. And then I still have my very first vintage Strat, my 1961 Strat that I've taken around the world many, many times. And that's, that guitar will never leave my side. Yeah. Wow. I haven't really got any, gotten rid of, I've never sold any equipment, at least not yet. Um, and so if there's anything of mine that's floating around out there and somebody says they've got Kenny Wayne Shepherd's this or that, it's because it grew legs somehow. <laughs> it's here, not because I ever sold it to anybody. So, you know, it's like I get I get kind of attached to, to things, you know. Okay, yeah. Especially instruments. Well, it makes you wonder, too. Uh, I, I'm just curious. Uh, Kenny Wayne Shepherd has a great ring to it. But what made you include your middle name? Is there a story behind that or? Actually, I was. It was what made me include the last name because I originally was just going by Kenny Wayne, because that's what everybody called. Hey, Kenny Wayne, you know. And so, but then I found out that there was this guy in Dallas 
that his name was Kenny Wayne as well. Hmm. He was like an older guy, had a long beard like Billy Gibbons. And nobody, I'd never heard of him before. He had only really had any small success like in the Dallas, Texas kind of area. But he came out of the woodwork because I put my band together and it was Kenny Wayne. And I started, you know, there was a buzz that started about me. And I guess at first when he heard people talking about it, he thought they were talking about him but they were talking about me and I think, you know, so that maybe got him fired up and a little bit annoyed. So he started sending these letters to my dad, you know, cease and desist, you know, threatening letters and how he's the original, this and that, whatever. And so we just did a little research and we got attorneys involved and we we're like, you know, what does this mean? And, and they were like, look, you know, you could be Kenny Wayne. You could be just Kenny Wayne everywhere in the world except for texas but he might have a legitimate claim to like performing in this in the in the state of texas under the name kenny wayne and that it could be a you know conflict or an infringement or whatever and so we just decided to be easier to add the last name shepherd and shepherd is actually my mom's maiden name like my last name my legal last name is people don't really pronounce it right like 90 percent of the time so and my dad when my parents got married my dad took my mom's name for his radio name. he was shotgun ken shepherd so it's like we just decided to use shepherd but yeah i originally wasn't doing the three name thing until i was kind of in a situation where i was forced to have to do something different so we added shepherd nice that's a good story then I, yeah i was wondering so it clears it up <laughs> well do you know uh i imagine you know uh guitarist orianti yeah i do yeah, I had her on not too long ago within the year, and I know this is the abbreviated kind of story, but I, I feel like you guys kind of have like a similar upbringing in a way. Like you both had dads that were big into music, and you kind of started following, and I think you got called up on stage, and is that kind of how you were discovered, sort of? It sounded similar well, to her. Well, sort of. I mean, I got brought up on stage when I was 13 years old. That was my first opportunity on stage. That's not how I got discovered, but that okay. was – that for me – gave me the confidence to go, oh, maybe I could actually put a band together and like do this, you know, because I didn't get booed off the stage, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I would say there's some similarities for sure. I mean, any young person coming up uh, in the entertainment industry is going to have some uh, similarities in their experiences, especially if they have family members involved and things like that. And then, you know, we're both guitar players. I mean, yeah, there's, I would say there's some parallels for sure. Well, that's good. And one guy that I really love, and it was a bucket list for me when I saw you guys in San Francisco, uh, was Buddy Guy, being able to see him come out. And I'm curious, you talk about having some confidence at a young age to not like get booed off the stage or whatnot. What's it like touring with him and playing in front of him? Were you nervous at first? or? Um, Not really. I mean, Buddy's always been a welcoming guy, and I've been doing shows with him on and off for, I don't know, 25 years or more. But yes, I always am fully aware of who I am in the presence of, you know, and he's a living legend. I mean, Buddy Guy was one of the guys that Jimi Hendrix looked up to, you know. I mean, that says a lot right there. It was always the same thing, playing with B.B. King or any of my mm -hmm. heroes, fully aware of the magnitude and the significance of the individual whose presence I am in, you know what I mean? And so, but I still just, you know, we're just playing music and we're just both, two music lovers and guitar players that are just exchanging ideas, you know. Have you ever played at his place, Legends, in Chicago? Yeah. Uh, not with my band, but, like, I showed up there and nice. sat in, made an appearance for an event. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was just curious because I was in Chicago a few years back and popped in and saw him play, so that was pretty surreal, too. Yeah. I'm also wondering, who's one of your favorite bands growing up? Because uh, I know you did some time with Van Halen, right, being around them. Was that your band as a kid? or? Yeah, I love Van Halen. I mean, they were like my favorite band, but I absolutely listened to a ton of Van Halen. I didn't really have a favorite. I mean, Stevie Ray was like my mm -hmm. biggest deal for a long period of time, for sure. But, I mean, I had a wide appreciation for music. So I listened to, you know, everybody from Hank Sr. to Hank Jr. to George Jones and Willie Nelson to James Brown and, uh, you know, ZZ Top and Allman Brothers and Leonard Skinner to Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker and Robert Johnson and Blind Lemon Jefferson and Lead Belly to 
Mm. I mean, everything in between. So, you know, I had a lot of of uh, artists who I admired. I don't really say that I had a, a favorite of any. Well, I am wondering uh, when it came to Van Halen, uh, what was it like being around uh, Eddie Van Halen? I've heard he was a great guy. So any good memories when you think of him or that time? I mean, he, yeah, he was a great guy. I mean, some people, everybody has their own unique experience, but mine was always good with him. Mm. Uh, we toured with them in the 90s and, and became friends and then maintained a friendship and then did that tour again with them in 2015, which ended up being the very last Van Halen tour. Wow. But he always came and found me every single day and went out of his way to come spend some time with me every day of the tour. Wow. Makes me wonder, too, one thing, like you talk about popping in with Buddy Guy. I know you've popped in, obviously, other places, too. But it kind of makes me think of comedians and how sometimes they'll pop in at a club and kind of surprise everybody. So is there anyone maybe in sports or, like, entertainment that you've kind of been inspired by, like having a relationship like that, that maybe they're they're in entertainment but they're not in music? Uh, I don't know. I would say, you know, most of my day-to-day -day re relationships are either with people in music or with my family. So, um, you know, you have encounters with all kinds of different people, you know, I mean, I run into magicians, I run into comedians, I run into actors, I run, you know what I mean? But like, I don't know, when you get to the point of like having an interaction with somebody that inspires you, I feel like it's on a deeper level. You know, and so that requires some some real time to be spent together. Mm -hmm. And right now, my most of my time is spent with musicians or at home with my family. Nice. Well, uh, one of my final questions here. Has there ever been like a moment that stuck with you? Because obviously you've played with a lot of your musical heroes. So is there anyone that complimented you at a certain part in, in your life that just was surreal and maybe stuck with you? Well, uh, there's not like one particular compliment, but like the, uh, the welcoming that bb king gave me at such a young age right like because he's the king of the blues mm. undisputed across the board how, household name and from the time i was you know first played with him at, at age 15 and we went on to have a very close consistent relationship and did many tours together many appearances together and played many times together but like being accepted uh by him and him encouraging me the way that he did, I think, was incredibly significant to a very young, impressionable musician who idolized a guy like him. One thing I got to ask you before I let you go, I asked Oriampi this question because uh, you both have Hendrix uh, inspirations and a love for his music. So what's your favorite song of his? Well, I mean, I like Voodoo Child. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I've been every one of my shows since I put my mm -hmm. band together at age 15 with that song. And it's become, you know, just kind of like an extension of who I am as a musician. And that's just like, I feel like we kind of own that song to a, a certain degree nowadays uh, when it comes to performing it. And mm -hmm. so it's just become like part of my DN musical DNA. Uh, so, and it's one of those great songs. It's one of the greatest guitar rock anthems ever written. And it's such a great platform to just like really do your thing. Yeah. Well, mine is, uh, I wish it was longer. It has that perfect amount of tease where you want it to keep going. Uh, Little Wing, that's that's always my yeah. go-to. Sure. Do you ever squeeze in Manic Depression? Is that one that gets in the set list? Or no, Zach Wilde's doing that one on this tour. Oh. and done it years ago, but uh, no, it's not really a regular for me. Okay. Well, Kenny, uh, it's been great to have you on. Fun to get to know you a little bit. And uh, last question, then uh, you're on the road. You're in Santa Rosa. The show's tonight. So what's kind of your uh, plans on a show night? Like, what do you do to get ready or to kill time? <laughs> uh, you know, man, I just exercise and then sound check. And, I mean, on this tour, there's a lot of social atmosphere. You know, you got so many artists, and we're all kind of hanging out together backstage. So it's really about the hang and, uh, and then just get up there and do what we do best. Nice. All right. Well, it was great to have you on, and we're going to put the link in the bio to check out your new album, Dirt on My Diamonds Volume 2. And Kenny, uh, thanks for coming on. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks for having me.